Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Bible teaching session. We thank you for this Congress. It's a special Congress. We feel the fire. We feel the anointing. We see the revival. We see what you are doing. We are praying, O oh Lord, what you have started, you will complete in Jesus' name. In every heart, in every section of this church, in the leadership of the church, and all the people that are following the revival fire that we have kindled already will never die out in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, you help us not to worship at the altar of prosperity, not to worship at the altar of worldliness, but to worship only at the feet of Jesus, because Jesus only will never fail. I pray, Lord, you grant us that conviction. And as we retain that conviction, we pray, Lord, our worship will be acceptable in your sight, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, don't sit down yet, read after me. My commitment. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die is cast. I've stepped over the line. My decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down. I won't back away. Or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I am finished and done with low living. With sight walking, with small planning, with smooth knees, with colorless dreams, with tamed visions, with mundane talking, with cheap living, with dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence or prosperity or position or promotion or plaudits of popularity. I don't have time to be right, to be forced, to be top, to be recognized, to be praised, to be regarded, to be rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on his presence. I walk by patience. I live by prayer. I labor by power. My face is set. My gate is past. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way raw. My companions few. My guide reliable. My mission clear. I cannot be bought. I cannot be compromised. I cannot be deterred. I cannot be lured away. I cannot be turned back. I cannot be deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. I will not hesitate in the presence of the adversary. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. I will not ponder the pool of popularity. I will not meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let up until I've stayed up, until I've stood up, until I've prayed up, until I've paid up, until I've preached up the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he comes. Give until I drop. Preach all I know. And walk until he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. May God confirm that in your life in Jesus' name. 
You can please be seated. Today we're looking at Revelation chapter 2. And we're in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through to 17. Today we're looking at this particular church. And the message the Lord is giving us through this church is to warn us of the danger of compromise in the church. Let's read the text together. Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pagamos write, These six, says he, which has the, seven sh the, the sharp sword or two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them, thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication, so as thou also them, that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And then he says, which sin I hate, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. I will fight against them of the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving except he that receiveth it. That's the message the Lord is giving us today. As we look at this message, Christ's message, so the church in Pagamos confronts the, conf the, the, the compromising or the corrupting influence of compromise in the church. These letters of the Lord Jesus Christ, these messages of the Lord Jesus Christ, we call them these epistles of the Lord Jesus Christ of the seven churches of Asia Minor. They were reaching to the churches mentioned, but the message contained in them, they are the message of Christ. And those messages transcend those churches. Each message is applicable to the church today. And each message is applicable to each Christian today. That's the reason why we're studying them. Because, you know, at the end of every message, the Lord Jesus Christ said, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, not just to this church, but what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. Christ's introduction to this compromising church is threatening and frightening. He speaks of his authority as a judge, judicial authority. To these compromisers, he talks of the two sharp, the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And that's the stern word of judgment about to fall on the compromisers in that church and in every church. Here is the first negative introduction from the one who wields the sword of judgment. You see the other introductions that he made of himself to the church, for example, to the church in Ephesus, unto the church, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things, says he, that folded the seven stars in his right hand, and he walketh in the midst of the, of the seven golden candles. That's positive. He's walking in the midst of his people. He's evaluating them, examining them. He's defending them, delivering them. And he's comforting them and strengthening them because he's holding those stars and those leaders in his hand. That's a positive introduction. When you come to the next church, again, it's a positive introduction unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. That's positive. Telling them, I've always been there. I will always be there. And I'm going to be with you till the end of your journey, until the end of your race, until the end of your battle. I'm going to be there all the time. Fear not, fear none, be faithful. 
because he's the first and the last. And because he was dead, and now he's alive, and alive forevermore. He told that church, you have nothing, nothing to fear, because I'll never leave you, and I will never forsake you. So, you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper, of whom shall I be afraid? But, when it comes to this church, this is a third church, and it's a third message. The introduction here is very, very different, which means then, to the forward, the Lord will be forward. And to the pure, the Lord will be pure. And to the faithful, the Lord will be faithful. The Lord looks at the condition of every church, and then, according to the condition and the need or necessities in that church, he introduces himself. He has many attributes, he has many descriptions, he has many characteristics, but he chooses the attribute, the characteristic that will fit the condition of that church. Here was a compromising church, and therefore the thing he had for them was negative. It says here that he is the one that has the sword, the two sharp, the sharp two edged sword coming out of his mouth. And it is for every church uh, this kind of sword of judgment, stern, rebuke, judgment of the Lord. It's for every church tolerating evil, tolerating error, accommodating sin in their midst. Many churches today are as compromising as the church in Pagamos, and it's turned in the danger of imminent judgment. When the book of Revelation was reaching actually to Pagamos, and you know this letter reaching to Pagamos, Pagamos was the capital of Asia for almost 400 years. Think about that. Think about that because uh, there are some consequences of that. As we look at this church in this city of Pagamos, uh, you understand that before this time, that this city had been the capital of Asia Minor, that's of a province, of a community, of a territory, for about 400 years. The accumulation of evil, the accumulation of error, the accumulation of idolatry, the accumulation of emperor worship, the accumulation of everything that is evil for those 400 years, and yet a church was planted there. But the condition and the climate and the things ran around in that city affected that church. It was a pagan city. It was acclaimed a cultural center. And it was famous for its library, which contained 200,000 volumes. You need to think about that. It was, it was a city given to education. And when you think of a library at that time, understand, understand that at that time there was no printing press. Because the printing press came centuries later. And so, all those volumes were handwritten. And these were real big volumes. In fact, we are told that when you stack those books together, side by side, that it will run miles. They were big volumes. Then you understand what kind of city that was. And yet, Christ said something even more than that. He said this. He said, I know where you're dwelling. I know where you're living. That's where Satan's seat, Satan's throne is. Uh, you know, when you think about uh, uh, Smyrna, it says, I know where you are. I know there you are, a synagogue of Satan. Because there are people that are worshipping Satan. Pagan worship, Satan worship in, in Smyrna. But in this place now, it's not just that you have a synagogue of Satan. You have there a seat, a throne for Satan. That must be a challenge to the church there. It must be a challenge to the people there. It must be a challenge maintaining sound doctrine. In such a place, look at it in verse 13. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. That word seat actually means throne the original, where Satan set his throne. And from there, he will send out all his emissaries and will send out 
all the sorrow. It was in that place you had the very origin and the fountain and the source of evil. And evil was flowing out of that fountain and source. I know where you are dwelling. That's the place where Satan's throne, where Satan's siege is. And think of the cruelty and the wickedness and the violence there. That's why it says, and thou holdest fast my name. And then it says, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was a my faithful matter, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. You understand here? You understand here? It says uh, Satan will be walking about, to and fro in the world, up and down in the world, but anywhere he went, he'll come back to Pagamos. Because that's where his seat was. That's where his throne was. That's what Jesus said. And then where Satan dwells. If you think you're a pastor and you're having a difficult time in the village, in the city, in the town, in the country where you are, you need to have been a pastor in Pagamos. That's a great, great challenge. A great, great challenge. But there was still a church there. But the unfortunate thing is that church was not actually fully free, completely free from compromise. And that's why the Lord is bringing this to us. He wants us to see his attitude to compromise, his attitude to tolerating error, his attitude to uh, patting error at the back and saying, well, it's not too bad, we can coexist together. And the Lord wants you to see what his attitude is, that what he has is that he has a sharp, two-edged sword coming against evil and coming against sin and coming against the corrupting influence of the people that peddle false doctrine. There are three points we're going to look at in the message. Number one, the description of Christ and the diagnosis of the church. The description of Christ and the diagnosis of the church. Number two, defilement and destruction through compromise. Defilement and destruction through compromise. Number three, the delight and the destiny of overcoming Christians. The delight and the destiny of overcoming Christians. I come to point number one, the description of Christ and the diagnosis of this church. Come back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13. Revelation 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pagamos write, These things, says he, which has the sharp sword with two edges. Here is the way the Lord Jesus Christ described himself, the description of Christ. And if you go back to chapter 1, because I, I told you before that all these descriptions, they are taken in the vision of the glorified risen Christ that you find in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 16, it says, And he had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Here you find the description of the Lord. Many times when we think about the Lord, we don't think fully about all his attributes, all his characteristics because we associate the Lord Jesus Christ with his love and meekness and we think of him as a gentle lamb, as a loving lamb, as a compassionate one. As the one that went about doing good and healing all that are oppressed of the devil. We think about him as our savior and our loving Lord. And that's wonderful. That is good. But do you understand that there is a time when the lamb will become the lion. And it will be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then he says there's a time when he will not just be the savior. He will be the judge of the whole earth. Because he says the father judges no man. But he has committed all judgment into the hands of the Son. And there is a time coming when Jesus Christ, when you see him, what you will see will not be the love, will not be the mercy, will not be the grace, will not be the compassion. It will be the sword that is coming out of his mouth. And it will be the sword 
of judgment. He tells us that. He tells us that. Look at it in that same chapter, chapter 2 and verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16, repent or else. I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them. Can you think of Jesus fighting? Can you, see, can you think of Jesus judging? Can you think of Jesus being firm? Can you think of Jesus bringing eternal judgment on the compromisers in the church? That's exactly what he said. He said, repent. Then he said, or else I will come. And when I come, he says, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And that is, he'll fight against the compromisers. And it is not the only place in Revelation that you find the sword coming out of his mouth. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 19. I'm reading to you from verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with feet it shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. That's God. That's Christ. That's Jesus. That's our loving Savior. When he becomes a judge, the description of Christ, the way he described himself, he said, at last, the people that have refused to repent, the people that have rejected his mercy, the people that have rejected his love, there is something he's going to do. It's going to come. And it's going to come as the mighty judge, and he will tread the fierceness of the wrath of the burning judgment of the Almighty God. Look at verse 21. In verse 21 of Revelation chapter 19. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that searched upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And there's something you know about the sword. You normally handle the sword with the hand. When a warrior is fighting, and he wants to execute judgment, punishment, upon the people he had captured, uh, taken captive, he will normally execute that judgment with a sword in the hand. But this sword is not in the hand. This sword is coming from the mouth. Which tells you something about that kind of sword. That this is not the literal sword. And yet, it's as sharp as a sword. And it's as piercing as a sword. And it brings execution like a sword. And it brings the final irrevocable punishment that comes from on high like a sword. What kind of sword is this? This is the final body. This is the word of authority and power coming out of the mouth of Christ. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And see, you understand, when it says the sword is coming out of his mouth. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing, even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It says the word of God, the word of the gospel today, is like a sword, and is piercing to the very heart and spirit and mind. And it's dividing asunder, even the marrow and the body. But the sword at that time will be coming from the word, from the from the word of the Lord. Now, as he talks about the description of himself, that he's going to visit judgment upon the people that were not walking straight, were not believing right, were not staying and standing on sound doctrine on this eternally unchanging word he had given that they allowed Balaam's disciples and they allowed the Nicolaitans to come and put false doctrine into the church. And there were some members of that church that imbibed, that accepted, that received, that lived by that kind of false doctrine and deception of the devil. The Lord Jesus Christ said, it's coming. 
It's coming. It's coming. And when it comes, it will not be coming. It will not be coming to take you home to glory. It will be coming to judge those people that have compromised and they have not repented. After he gave a description of himself, then he gave a diagnosis of the church. Come back to Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at verse 13. Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. is commending them here for something. It's praising them here for something. It's telling them, hey, there is something you, do, you did well. In verse 13, I know thy works. And you know, that's what Jesus is always saying. Because he is all knowledge. He knows all things. He knows the mysteries. He knows the hidden things. He knows the things we might hide from one another. He knows the depths of our hearts. He knows the details of our lives. And he says, I know thy works. Speaking to the Ephesians church, he said, I know, I know, I know. And speaking to Smyrna, I know. And then he comes to Pagamos and he says, I know. And then he comes to the last church, the Lord Jesus church, I know and when he comes to you and when he comes to our church today, he says the same thing. I know he knows your works. He knows your life. He knows your experience. He knows what you might hide from one another. He knows the commendable things and he knows the other things that are condemnatory. In verse 13 he says, I know thy works. And where thou dwellest. And sometimes when we're ministering in some places, we're preaching, we're pastoring in some places, and we're saying, this is a difficult place. Jesus says, yes, I know. This is a demon infested place. Jesus says, yes, I know. This is a very tough place where it's very difficult to stand on sound doctrine. Jesus says, yes, I know. And it looks like over here, you are going to need abundance of the grace of God to be able to stand on the truth. And Jesus says, yes, I know. I know where thou dwellest. I know where you are ministering. I know the challenges and the difficulties and the problems that are facing you. Yes, I know. And what comfort we have. As we come before the Lord Jesus Christ and we examine the details of our ministries and then we can tell, we can say, yes, things are tough, yes, things are wrong, yes, things are difficult. And yet I know that Jesus knows every problem in the way of ministry in this area. That's the comfort a child of God, a minister of God, a servant of God ought to take because he knows that Jesus knows about everything. He says, I know where that dwell is. Even where Satan's seat is. Now, as, uh, as I said, where Satan's seat is, you wonder, how on earth could Satan make a seat there? He's a god of this world. Uh, it, it was like a concentration of worldliness there. A concentration of idolatry there. A concentration of superstition there. A concentration of evil there. A concentration of false doctrine there. Anything you know about the devil, anything you know of the characteristics of the attitude and the works of the devil, there was a concentration of the activities of the devil in Pagamos. That's why Jesus said, I even know that Satan's throne, Satan's seat is right there. And it's like Satan is dwelling there. Although he operates in different areas of the world, he goes up and down in different areas of the world, but anywhere he goes, he comes back there. Anywhere he goes, he comes back there. And that's where he plots. That's where he plans. That's where he achieves his plan. That's why he, de he develops his strategy. That's where he has his throne. And I know that's where you are. Imagine, think about it yourself. If you were ministering in a place where Satan's seat, Satan's throne is, You'll have a lot of excuses to compromise. You say, it's not my fault. Things are very tough here. It's like any false prophet you can find anywhere in the world, they'll have a, an headquarters in that place where Satan's seat is. And if you happen to be ministering in such a place, where Satan's seat is, and yet Jesus Christ has all the grace, all the strength, all the power to be able to uphold you so that you can stand on the unchanging word of God even though Satan's throne or Satan's seat might be there. 
And then he even says, look at it, what Jesus said to this church. And he said, and thou holdest fast my name. Satan sits there, you hold fast my name. Satan's throne is there, you hold fast my name. The concentration of evil, corruption, worldliness is there, you hold fast my name. And in fact, the persecution rose to the point that there was one of your elders, one of your leaders, Antipas, or in the day that they took him and murdered him, all the same, you hold fast my name. What a wonderful thing. The Lord is saying that we can still hold on and hold fast the name of the Lord, even where Satan's seat is, and even when the persecution may rise up to the point that one of the leaders, one of the elders, might be taken and murdered and killed for the faith. Look at this. When it says you hold fast his name, and it's challenging us from the life of the church in Pagamos, challenging us that we can still hold fast the name of the Lord and the word of the Lord, even in the, among the people that are trying to corrupt the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, look at this in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I'm reading to you from verse 9. What a challenge here. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Holding fast. Grip that thing, grab that thing, the sound word of God. The gospel of the Lord Jesus, don't let it go. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, so precious and so saving, that saves the soul. The sound doctrine, the word of the Lord, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gain says. And that's what they did to an extent, to a point in that church. And that's, that's the challenge the Lord is giving you and giving to everyone hearing this word that no matter how difficult it may be, it won't be more difficult than as it was in Pagamos. No matter how many false prophets might be there in your community, it won't be worse than what happened in Pagamos. And you can still hold fast the word of the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading verses 13 and 14, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee Keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. The good word of salvation. Hold it fast. That good word of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Hold it fast. That good word of separation from the world. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because the lust of the flesh and the lust of the, of, the, of, of the eyes and the pride of life. They are not of the Father. And anyone that loves the world will pass away with the world. But he that doeth the will of our Father who is in heaven is the one that will abide forever. And that if a person, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a member of the church is a friend of this world, he'll be an enemy of God. Don't let them snatch it from your hand. Don't let them take it from your message. Hold it fast. It's been given unto you. Hold it fast and keep it by the Holy Ghost that dwelleth in us. The word of marriage. One man, one wife. That good doctrine, that good word that have been committed into your hand. That's what the Lord is saying. The challenge will be there. The challenge to compromise. And the challenge to leave the faith. And the challenge to water it down. And the challenge to compromise a little. And the challenge to cut it little by little. Hold it fast. I was in the women's section yesterday. And I had a chance of talking to them. And you husbands, you need to hear what I told them. I challenge those women as mothers in Israel that years ago people knew us by our appearance, they knew us by our dressing, they knew us by our comportment, and that if you saw any Christian sister in the bus, 
or on the road, in the city, anywhere. You've never met her. Just the comportment, just the appearance, just the dressing, you will know. You will ask, are you from deeper life? And the lady will smile and say, yes, I am. And will say, yes, I knew that. I knew you are one of my sisters. Because we knew one another by keeping the standard. But today, I told this woman yesterday that things are changing. It's like in the 70s, you know, the sleeves of their dress. In the years that had been coming, from 73 to 77, still all right, 78, still all right. You remember Jesus, 78. Wonderful time, wonderful revival. And then when it came to 1980, from that time on, from 80 to 83, they cut the sleeve. They cut it, those of you far away, I'm trying to demonstrate with my arm, they cut about an inch or two inches away. Then 1986, 87, they cut another inch or two away. 1980 something, by 2000, by this time we're living now, if you look at some of these women, the sleeves of their dress, they have almost cut everything away. I was asking them yesterday that the way you are cutting it inch and inch and inch and inch, by 2010, if Jesus uh, tarries and he doesn't come in time, there will be no sleeves at all. It will be like, you know, this kind of singlet that you wear that doesn't have anything. In fact, some of the women are already wearing that. And then they'll put something like a coat on it. The coat we wear, they'll go and sew coats for themselves. They say, okay, they don't allow us to wear trousers or wear coat. See this woman. And we cannot keep the standard within a few years, but the Lord is saying that you all pass the form of sound word which you have heard of me in faith and in love, which is in Christ Jesus. And that good thing, which was committed unto me, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. Everybody knew, even those who are not in deeper life, that all, the, all those separated dresses, the lace, whatever you call them, that we didn't even accept lining them underneath. We rejected them. And many of us, not me, because I never had them, you know, as a sinner, there were some things I just never got into. God saved me and rescued me and protected me from all those things. Praise the Lord for me. I said, if you cannot praise the Lord for yourself, praise the Lord for me. Now praise the Lord for yourself. You know, and there were some things that the Lord rescued me from. But those people that were having those, they bought them, they destroyed them. How you see that the things that were burnt and the things that were taken away, many years ago, many people are going back to them. The Lord is calling us back at this time and he's saying, hold fast the form of sound words. With thou hast heard of me in faith and in love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing, sound doctrine is good. Standing by the word of God is good. And I, I know it's good because, you know, there, there are some people, they, even, they cherish it. They want to do it, but they don't know how. They don't know how. And uh, sometimes I have the privilege and the joy when I go to some places and some people privately, they come to talk to me. And when they talk to me, they say, we, we want to do this thing the way you are doing it, but we cannot in our church. They say, how do you do it? That you're able to stand on this thing. We've been listening to you since the 70s, to the 80s, to the 90s. And one still saw me this year. This, uh, okay, this uh, 2002, last year, letter part December last year, just last month. And said, how do you do this thing and stand on this? I said, we just stand on it. I said, when you stand, the wind will blow. And the thunders will clap. And a lot of things, so it will look threatening and deafening. But to keep on standing there saying, I'm standing with Jesus. I'm standing with the eternal word of God. And this thing the Lord has kept, given me, I'm going to keep it to the very end. No matter what happens, even if a hammer blows up my head, it will blow me into eternal life and into glory. I don't care. I don't mind. I'm going to stand. I said, you go and stand like that. If you're willing to stand, that no matter what wind is blowing and no matter what fire is burning. You are willing to stand and you trust your life into the hand of the Lord. You can stand and you will stand in Jesus' name.
the diagnosis of this church that the Lord said, you've been standing faithful, holding fast my name, and you have not denied my name, even in those days when terrible fierce persecution came unto you. We need people like that today that will stand no matter what may be happening around them. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears, that ye stand fast, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then it tells us in Second Peter chapter chapter 3, 2 Peter, chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 17, 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 17, it says, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also be led away, or the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. Don't allow the air of the wicked, the wind that may be blowing, the multiplicity of false prophets, false doctrines around you or this time. Don't let that make your sheep stand on this eternal, unchanging, infallible word of God. In Jude verses 3 and 4. Jude verses 3 and 4. Beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. When Jude wrote to the believers, he was telling them, Now, if you are going to keep the faith, there is going to be a fight. There's going to be contending. And it says, earnestly contend. And you know, brothers and sisters, and many of us are preachers, and you are pastors and overseers, where the Lord has appointed and ordained and anointed and commissioned you. If you're going to keep the faith, now preaching steadfastness, faithfulness, is different from preaching healing. It's different from preaching the mercy of God and the love of God and the goodness of God. Helping people to have faith to receive healing is different from telling them to stand on the word of God. When they have a barrage of many, many things confronting them and knocking at their door and putting pressure on them and you want them to stand like a soldier of Christ, that whatever comes their way, they'll be able to stand on this unchanging word of God. You put all your strength, you put all your voice, you put all your energy, you put all your encouragement, you put all your conviction, you put everything you have within you into such a message telling them it's a fight telling them they must contend and when they contend they are not just contending in a sluggish way they are not just contending in an apologetic manner they are contending earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints if they are going to stand if we are going to stand that's how to do it and then it tells us in verse 4 it says for there are certain men kept in on our ways who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason you need to tell the people to really stand. Before pointing out the corrupting influence of compromise in this church, Christ first reveals areas of their faithfulness, which was commendable in that church. The church was in the city where Satan sees Satan's throne was. And the city was the very seat of Satan. It was the center of Caesar's worship. In fact, history has told us there was a mighty altar, a huge altar, a, a massive a idol of Zeus that was there in that same city. And then because it was a city, it was a center from where pagan worship spread to the rest of the Roman Empire. That's the reason it was difficult for them to stand. And yet they stood. And the same God that helped them to stand will help us to stand in Jesus' name. 
not just help us. Christ's name. Ad and adhering steadfastly to him and to his cause. They did not deny the faith in Christ. Even in the face of opposition and martyrdom. And the Lord Jesus has commended their faithfulness and steadfastness. Point number two. Defilement and destruction through compromise. Defilement and destruction through compromise. In Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at it from verse 14 all through to verse 16. But I have a few things against thee. What if Jesus were to come to you right now? I mean, I'll say, I remember when you were saved. I remember when you gave your life to me. I remember when you became sanctified. I remember when you looked at your wardrobe and you selected all the things that will not honor me, all the things that will not make you to live according to my word. And you selected them one after the other and you threw them away. I remember when you made your consecration to me. I remember when you gave yourself to me completely. And then after telling you, I remember your faithfulness when your in-laws challenged you. I remember your faithfulness and steadfastness when your relative that has a mushroom church ministry assembly somewhere was inviting you to come there and said, no, although we are relatives, but going to heaven is a personal matter. I cannot join you in that kind of fellowship. You are not preaching the truth. And the Lord reminds you of the stand you are taking and the good things you have done. And then while you are smiling, he says, but... I have a few things against you. That's what happened in this church. While they were reading the epistle to them, and the Lord was commending them, and it appeared that it was a good church, a good church, and they were congratulating themselves, everything was okay. And the Lord is very happy with us. And the Lord takes pleasure in us. And he says, he remembers our steadfastness. He remembers our faithfulness. And then, while they were still rejoicing that this is a good thing about it, Jesus said, but I have a few things against thee. How will you feel that the loving Jesus, your Savior, your Lord, your Master, the compassionate one, that he says, I love you, I love your steadfastness, but there is a but, there is a blemish, there is a blame, there is a spot, there is something that I detest, I don't like in your fellowship. Verse 14, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast lived, thou hast bear them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Can you think about that? That there were people in that local church, in that local assembly, that were telling the members of the church, look up here, my brothers and sisters, here is the way it happens. The preacher and the pastor in that church will stand on the pulpit and declare the word of God. And then will lead people to faithfulness. I will remind them, brothers and sisters, members of this, our good church, remember, Antipas has gone to heaven before us. It was a tough time. It was great persecution. But he stood. And by the grace of God, that's the preacher in that church preaching to them, by the grace of God, as our dear brother, Antipas stood, and now is in heaven. Every one of us, we're going to stand in Jesus' name. And they all said, Amen. After the meeting, and they prayed, and they cried, and they made their vows and consecrations, we're going to be steadfast to the end. After they finished, there were some disciples of Balaam, and some disciples of Nicholas, Nicolaitans. They'll wait outside. And they'll say, uh -uh. What's the matter with you that you're still... Are you crying? Your eyes are swollen. And your eyeballs are reddish. What's the matter? Ah, you see, <laughs> is it because of what Pastor said? You want to die like Antipas? Okay, oh. And then they will turn back and say, It is not as serious as that. That actually, if we understand... That we are not under the law, we are under grace. And because we are under grace, God has loved us with everlasting love. If we understand the love of God, he saved us. 
after saving us, he has made use of eternally precious blood on us. Now, because his blood is precious, he doesn't see what you do. He sees you through Jesus Christ. That you, as a Christian, you love the Lord. Jesus Christ covers you. Whatever you do, God does not see what you do. All that God sees is Jesus in you and on you. Not only that, because of the grace of we didn't save ourselves. He saved us. Because he decided to save us, our sin, our flesh, the world, and Satan, they are not strong enough to change the original decision of God that he saved us. And then the people say, ah, they'll be nodding their heads like this. Therefore, you are just punishing yourself because whether you commit fornication or not, adultery or not, or you eat things sacrificed to idols or in the sight of God, you are not a sinner. You understand? You are a saint of God, a child of God. Your name is in the book of life, and nobody can take that name out of the book of life. They'll be nodding their heads like this. Therefore, really, seek sacrifice to idols. Do you believe in idols? Whether they sacrifice them to idols or not, what's your problem there? You take the food, you take the meat, you wash it, you wash all their rituals and ceremonies out of it. Then you lay your hands on it, you sanctify it. Don't you have authority to sanctify? And the people nod their heads. So, yes, I understand now. Now, this fornication you are talking about, think about it yourself. That somebody will meet with a woman and 10 minutes of, you know, useless something, which is, you know, like somebody is eating food, like he's drinking water. He does whatever it is, 10 minutes, and God will throw him to hell for 1,000 years, 1 million years, 10 million, you think, it, is that reasonable? They will be nodding their head like this. Do you still believe in Jesus? I believe in Jesus. Uh -huh. Whatever you do with your hand, whatever you say with your mouth, whatever you do with your body, all that doesn't matter. The body will die. It will go to the grave. Your soul, your spirit, washed by the blood of Jesus, that is clean and pure in the sight of God, will go to heaven. You understand? And those people will stay outside there and destroy the message of commitment that the pastor in Pagamos preached. And the people will have liberty now. Adultery, fornication, nothing mattered anymore. And then the pastor will overhear that some of the people, they were doing something like that. And before the pastor challenged them, some of those disciples of Balaam, they were calm. And they will see that pastor. They will say, Pastor, here, this one that you are preaching, I see you are developing soldiers to go and fight on the battlefront. The preaching you are preaching, that you shout, 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 and you are trying to terrify people. How about love? How about tenderness? How about tolerating people? How about accommodating people? There is preaching. There is people management. Pastor, you understand? There is preaching. There is, you know, talking and talking and talking and see if we are fighting on the pulpit. That one is there. But there, are, there is love. There is tenderness. There is how to control people, how to lead people, how to love people, and how to keep them. Some pastors they don't know how to keep people. Pastor, you understand? You are a very good preacher. When it comes to doctrine, faithfulness, vow, consecration, you are, you are wonderful. But pastor, you need to go and develop your skill of people management. After that, after he himself to pastor, he'll be nodding. He'll be nodding. He wants to be a good man. And then they will tell him, okay, now you may hear that so on. There are the people that influence so and so to commit the adultery or to eat things sacrificed to idols. You may hear that so and so ate things sacrificed to idols. You may hear so and so committed fornication or adultery. But pastor, let me tell you, if you touch that man, this church congregation will scatter on your head. And my hand is not there. But I want to tell you that that man is a crowd puller. If you touch him in the name of church discipline, if you touch him in the name of, I want to develop anti past people, the people that will stand for the truth, courageous people, people of conviction, people that will not care to go into the fire. Uh -huh. If you touch that man, I'm telling you, because we are your eyes, although you don't accept. 
when you don't see anything, we, we mix with the crowd, we mix with the congregation, we are the eyes of the pastor. Let me tell you, all this discipline, eating sacrifice to idols is gone. Fornication is gone. That one is gone. If you touch so and so, you scatter the church. What you have built, you'll destroy it yourself. My hand is not there. After that person has gone, pastor will do like this. And say, this is a tough thing. What will I do now? Well, I'll be preaching my own. Whatever they do, that's their business. So he will come, he will say, praise the Lord today. Jesus is still on the throne. This word of God will never change. This word of God is true. I've given it to you. Take it or leave it. If you don't do it, it's between you and God. Already it's changing. It's coming out of it. He doesn't want to suffer from that congregation. Those people are watching outside. They will tell them again. Don't mind him. Let him preach his own. We're telling you, whatever you do, you are eternally secured. That's how the corruption came into that church. That's what Jesus said here. I have a few things against you because you have them with you. You know them. They hold the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam that cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. You have them there and you have not dealt with them. There are some pastors here. They never discipline anybody. They cannot say, ah, my brother, why are you doing that? You cannot do that. There are some pastors here. They may discipline some other people that are not, they don't have connections in the church. When I say they don't have connections in the church, there are some people in the church, they come to church, they go back home. They don't have connections. They are not in this section of work. They are not in this section of work. They are not in this section of work. They are just believers. And they are just members of the church. And they are simple-hearted people. And there are some pastors. That's the only kind of people they can discipline. But the people that have connection, that if you touch so and so, his connection, his brothers, his sisters, and the people around him, they will rise up against that pastor. And that pastor will, if you didn't know what trouble is from dictionary, you'll know trouble from experience. When a pastor knows that, he will not touch those people. And their dressing may be wrong, their dressing may be bad. But they will not touch them. But thank God, thank God that you still have somebody here. That by the grace of God, you will frown at me. I look at you, I say, you are creating problems for yourself. Because when you frown, the muscles in your face, you know, they, they will be tensed up. And you are the one that may develop hypertension. And I'll keep on smiling. If the devil frowns, I smile. If those women, you know, sometimes so when I go to the women's section and I talk against jewelry and palming and all this jewelry and all these civil things, I talk, about, I talk against those things. While I'm coming out, I look at the faces of some of those women. It's like, we will not greet you. That's your good luck. If you don't greet me, look at thousands of people that are greeting me. If you like me, can you wave your hand at me? And all those people, you few people, two, three people that will not greet me. Did you see all those people waving hands at me? Don't greet me, that's your good luck. I'll keep on preaching what I'm preaching. And I'm happy. Am I happy? You can tell. Because when Jesus comes, the people that will go with him are the people that are standing on the word of God. The eternally unchanging, infallible word of God. And that's the reason why if we're going to keep the church away from compromise, away from corruption, we will keep all those things away and you come and you are firm according to the word of the Lord. Now, it talks about Balaam here. What did Balaam actually do? Already has told you what he did. Balaam called Balaam. And when Balaam called Balaam, it was, uh, you know, to curse the children of Israel. And then the Lord said, him, he said to him, you cannot do it. Those people, they are blessed. And then he couldn't curse them because God changed all the curses into a blessing. And then eventually, Balaam said, you cannot get these people. The only way you can get them is to make your women go into them and corrupt them. And then Balak did that. And the children of Israel went into a multitude of them. And as how there were many of them were destroyed 
But although, do you see the, the case of Balaam? When the angel met him, by the way, and he said, your way is perverse before me. And what we find out is that he escaped the sword that time, but eventually the sword still got him. Look at it in Numbers chapter 31. Numbers chapter 31, verse 8. Numbers 31, verse 8. And he slew the king of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi and Rechem and Zor and Or and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Baal, the slew of the sword. He escaped the sword earlier. But now eventually, because of teaching people to corrupt others and to compromise and to sin and to offend the Lord and to come under the judgment of God, eventually he came under the sword. That's what Jesus Christ said. Come on, look at it now in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 verse 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them of the sword out of my mouth. So the Lord is telling the compromising churches, the people that stood on the truth before, but they are no more standing on the truth. He's saying he's going to fight the compromisers. You might remember if you're a preacher, the way you used to preach, before you mellowed down, before you softened, before you changed, and now people in your church, people that listen to you, they can do whatever it is they want to do, and you do not have the heart. To tell them that this is the way of destruction. This is the way of perdition. In Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel chapter 44. The Lord is telling us to get the fire back. The Lord is telling us to get the conviction back. The Lord is telling us that we need to go back again to the very source of what we had before. So that the fire of God can come upon the heart, upon the spirit, upon our souls, and upon our lives. And we'll preach the word of God again with conviction, and with authority, and with boldness. It will not allow anyone to deceive you, or to crush you, or to put so much pressure on you that you cannot stand for what you ought to stand for. In Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 12, because they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, therefore have I lifted up mine hand against them, says the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity and they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. You see these people here, as they have corrupted the priesthood, the Lord was saying that he will not grant them chance to be in his presence anymore. You lose the power of God. You lose the presence of God. You lose the approval of God when you get into a compromise. Malachi chapter 2. In Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. Malachi chapter 2. Verse 7, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but he had departed out of the way. Talking to the priest, talking to the leaders, talking to the people that were ministering the word unto the people of God. He said, you have departed out of the way, and ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye and have not kept my ways. But you have, you have been partial in the law. Partial in the law. Verse 10, it says, Have we not all one father? Have not one God created us? Why do ye deal treacherously every man against his brother for, by, by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously. 
and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. He has married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord shall will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And you'll see that the Lord is against compromise in a very forceful way. You say, uh, why do people get into this kind of thing? Why doesn't God check them? Why doesn't God control them? Why doesn't God help them open their eyes so that they will not get into such a sin? Well, the Lord tries to help them, but they reject the, tr uh, the help of the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 2, from verse 8, chapter 2, verse 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, Deceivable of un deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, for this cause, because of that, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure, they had pleasure, they had pleasure in unrighteousness. There are some people that have pleasure in unrighteousness. And instead of building their camp with the people that are standing for sound doctrine for the word of God, they'll rather compromise and befriend and try to seek the favor of the people that are not standing on the truth. So God will lead them unto their own evil ways and eventually judgment will come upon them. I pray that every one of us will escape the judgment of God in Jesus' name. This compromising church deteriorated the disciples of Balaam who hold the doctrine of Balaam, casting a stumbling block before the church members, leading them to idolatry and fornication and immorality. The church also had among the membership and leadership those who held the doctrine of the Nucleitans, a, a doctrine of perverted grace, which Christ hated and which Christ still hates today. Compromise makes a church soft and tolerant of evil, tolerant of heresies, you know, Balaam was a prophet for hire. And there are some prophets like that today, some preachers like that today, some ministers like that today, they are for hire. They're just for whatever they can get, whatever they can gain. I pray the Lord will deliver us from them in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now, the delight and the destiny of overcoming Christians. The delight and the destiny of overcoming Christians. I come to Revelation chapter 2 again. Revelation chapter 2. As we look at Revelation chapter 2, it says in verse 16, repent. That is, the Lord was calling the people to repent. Uh, can you look up for a moment? I want you to just forget about every other person now. Think about yourself. When you attend retreat, just, just think, just think. You come into that retreat and you look at your spiritual level, your spiritual conviction, your spiritual life. You go through that retreat to the very end of that retreat. Two days after, please, can you look at your life? Is it any different from when you started that retreat? If we go to retreats and conferences and congresses like that and nothing ever changes, you always think the same way. You always act the same way. You always believe the same thing. You always behave the same way. What is the repentance? And that's what the Lord is looking at in our lives. The things we talk about, the things we mention, the things we point out, where is the correction? In at the headquarters church here, we're trying to help our workers. I mean, all our workers, ushers, choir, security, everybody. Everybody. The way we're trying to help them is this. We've divided them into groups. Because we have what we call 
the end of the month or once a month, first seminar of the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We have discovered over the years that many of our workers, dependable workers, effective workers, competent workers, faithful workers, and wonderful workers, many of our workers, they, they are lost in activity. They are lost completely in activity. When they are there, they do it with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. But they miss a lot from program to program. So what we have done in Lagos at the headquarters here is we have divided into groups that at this retreat now or at this space seminar now, only this group will minister. And all the others, all the others will sit down, just sit down totally, absolutely, just hear the word of God. I'm trying to do that on my part so that the blood of anyone will not be on me. So that nobody will say, well, but you appointed me and you put me there and you know I was there every time and you know the things I was having to deal with and you know there's no way I can benefit maximally when I'm on duty. So that's why so that your blood will not be on me. That's why we've divided everybody and we say now only once in five months or once in six months it may come to you that you will do something. The rest of the time, whatever program we're having, you are there just to sit down, hear the word of God. And we do that so that by the grace of God, this repentance, this restoration, this revival, it will come and it will come in Jesus' name. And some of you uh, leaders, I need to say this openly. Uh, seeking permission from me. Can you permit uh, brother so-and-so at the headquarters to come to our region, come to our uh, state, and come to our nation to help us in this area of work? You have the answer from me now? No. Because when you call, it may be the uh, brother national youth leader. You call him to this state and this state and this state and he's also here. He's busy in every street, busy every time. Is he going to have time to be able to take care of his own life? We want him to get to heaven too. Can you allow our head usher to, you know, come over here, train people? The answer, you've got the answer for me now? No. Can you allow a choir master here because we like this kind of music here. Let him come here, come there. You have the answer for me now? No. How about our people in the, you know, tapes and all that? This paper is wonderful what we see here. Great, great work is going on here. Well, one teaching and say, can you allow so-and-so to come? You have the answer for me now? No. I want to help our leaders. I want to help our people. That they'll think about their spiritual lives so that their lives will be according to the word of God, so that our people will not be going from activity to activity to activity, and then there is a kind of stalemate, hardened conscience, that they are not able to stand on the word of God. I was telling some of our leaders, I think as a leader in the security, I was saying, your security is superb and perfect. The orderliness organization is perfect. But I'm concerned for the spiritual life. That even though we have a perfect organization, a perfect administration, that's why we have also divided even the various security outfits so that the security people, they will minister just about once in five months in a face seminar and in our combined services we tell them now you come to only the service you belong to where you are living all the other services be in your district and relax so that activity will not eat up your spiritual life i'm saying it so that our state overseers and our region overseers you go back and you do the same thing don't make use of anybody too much so that they'll be able to care for their spiritual lives we're concerned there will be a restoration of holiness. There will be a restoration of revival. And there will be a restoration of the fire of God burning on our soul. And we want it to happen, and it's going to happen. I said it's going to happen. Now, whether you are slow or you are sluggish, it doesn't matter. It is going to happen, and it will happen in Jesus' name. And you, you see my style is not different. I don't need to apologize because you didn't give me the job. The Lord Almighty gave me the job and I know what to do. When I wake up early in the morning and I stay there and I look at everybody, 
I feel that for a purpose. That's my work. It's not just to stay at the pulpit here. Uh, you know, before my message, when the choir was about to come in, after I finished, um, you know, the singing here, and they were doing Bible reading, I was going around. Would you believe, as I was going around, with everything, with the effectiveness of the first message, with the wonderful songs that were sung, with everything that happened, I saw, I'm sorry to, I'm telling you what I saw. I cannot tell you what I didn't see. Because you women, <laughs> you know, some of you, you will, you, will, you will double your phone at me when I talk now. Women, can I talk? <laughs> okay. Because, you know, I always say I saw a woman. What's the problem with this pastor? <laughs> you never saw a man. It's only a woman you saw. I'm sorry, this is what I saw. When I see a man, I will tell you. I saw a woman, no Bible, nothing. And the Bible reading was going on. And that wonderful reading of Jeremiah going on. You know, she was just like that. And I tapped her. I said, where is your Bible? No Bible. I said, get up. From which state are you? She told me. I said, please, take her there. And get her state overseer to talk to her. And interview her. Whether she just came to see compound. Or she came for revival. Renewal. Refreshing. Why is it like that? With everything we're saying, with everything we're talking about. And there's some people that will be wondering, why is this man going around? Why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? What, did you give me an assignment? What's your problem? Anywhere I want to go. I was entering the usher's uh, room there, and somebody was following me. I said, why are you following me? I'm the pastor. That this is my place. Get back. I can get anywhere here. Anywhere I get to, you can't stop me. I need to see you now the way you live, the way you talk, what you do. I need to see you. This is how to help you to get to heaven. All this hide and seek business, that there's no spiritual life, that compromise is there. We must cancel everything from this January. The Lord is calling upon us to repent, and we will repent. I said we will repent. And then he tells us if we repent and we overcome. You call upon the Lord. You say, Lord, I want you to do something in my life. Then in verse 17 he says, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Are you hearing? I said, are you hearing? Then he says to him that overcome it. You overcome the doctrine of Balaam. You overcome the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You overcome all the, all the subtle suggestions to compromise and to yield in to the works of the flesh. If you overcome everything, to him that overcome it will I give to see it and to eat the healing manner. And will give him a white stone. That means the Lord will say that you have no question to answer. That everything is okay. That you can get to heaven. And this is glory. The weight of glory upon you. Which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Will you have it on that final day? I said, will you have it on that final day? Eyes have never seen. And ears have not heard. The things that God has prepared for them that love him. But the Lord is telling us, he has prepared all these things for a crown of life. Manna coming out of heaven. That is angel's food. The corn of heaven will be given unto you. Only if you overcome, will you not then tell the Lord today, I want to be an overcomer. I want to be an overcomer. All this spiritual sluggishness, all this spiritual hard-heartedness, all this spiritual stubbornness, all this spiritual disobedience, just hearing the word and not, and not really making use of it. Oh Lord, today, I'm going to bundle everything together. I'm going to bury everything. I want the fire of God to come upon my soul. I'm born all the lukewarmness, all the carelessness, all the indifference, all the disobedience. Born everything away from me. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, oh Lord, do something in me. Oh Lord, do something in me. Oh Lord, do something in me. Let there be a change, a transformation so that as you are transformed and the women are transformed and the men are transformed and the old church is transformed and the various section are uh, sections are transformed, then we will see a church that is pure, a church that is holy, a church that is purified, a church that Jesus will not say, I have something against you. Pray through, pray through today, call upon the name of the Lord and let the Lord himself do something in you that will be unforgettable. And when the restoration comes,